I first became aware that I wanted to be a lawyer uh, really in the early 70s. I was watching, there was a TV series called Crown Court. Uh, and uh, it was daytime TV. And I, was, I loved watching it as a small child. Uh, just this idea that what you have is argument by both sides and then the moment, the moment of decision. I loved it. And um, there's, a, there's an apocryphal story. Uh, well, it may be true, I don't know. But there's a story in the family that I was asked, uh, what would you like to do when you grow up? This is when I was probably five. And, uh, and apparently I said, well, since I can't be queen, I'll be a judge. Uh, and appar apparently this is true. I don't remember it, but this is what my mother tells me. My father, who passed away in 2010, uh, was in the Air Force during the Second World War, uh, uh, servicing radar installations. And then after the war, he joined the Scientific Civil Service and he worked as a rocket research scientist during the 1950s when we had a space rocket program in this country. So I was brought out with tales of, of, of rockets and science and uh, all the excitement around that time. It didn't take me long for be to become very interested in computers and computing and artificial intelligence and brains, uh, cognitive science and ultimately psychology, which is why I ended up going to Oxford to read psychology uh, and then stayed on to do my doctorate there, which was in a branch of the brain sciences related to how the human brain combines different sources of depth information that come in through the eyes into our three-dimensional perception of the world, which is, is very closely allied to the modern sciences of artificial intelligence and artificial vision. I've always enjoyed putting forward an argument, whether that's a scientific argument or, or, or now a legal argument. So there, wasn't, there was a slight sense of, of it being in the plan somewhere that I would be pulled into the law. So I went straight from my doctorate into the law. And in fact, the two overlapped in that towards the end of my doctoral studies, I was commuting from London to, to Oxford uh, writing my thesis on the bus whilst also studying for the law conversion course. I think the skills that I learnt as a scientist were very important. Um, I'd obviously spent three more years in full-time education, so I was a little older by the time I came to the bar. I was three years older, a little bit more mature, but I'd also learnt research skills but ri and writing skills too. So I went straight from writing my doctoral thesis, which is pretty long, into writing a textbook on law and I've written books regularly since then in the law. Um, I, I think those two have overlapped, um, and I think also understanding a bit of science can be useful when you're talking about scientific data in some court cases, whether that be personal injury or anything else, and I think it helps with understanding what evidence and probability actually are. In terms of the highlights of, of my career, in a sense, any time I've won a case that I've been slightly surprised to win and I've emerged into the atrium of the Royal Courts of Justice and just thought what a great job it is to, to be a barrister at that point. Uh, I, I won the tie trading case on uh, no win, no fee very early in my career. I boldly went off to the Court of Appeal, the three-judge Court of Appeal, on my own, no leader, not long out of pupillage, probably because the solicitor wouldn't want to pay a higher fee, and argued for the whole day on the legality of whether you can have a no win no fee agreement and I've, I, I don't think I've ever had a happier day in the law than being able to walk down a, a long line of legal texts, pick one up and, and, and speak and persuade and have the court listen to me uh, and then on top of that the bonus of actually winning. Uh, so I think that was, the, that was like, the highlight of my career as a bar at the bar. I was born, uh, I was assigned male at birth, as they say, to, to use the sort of PC terminology, and, and I spent my life uh, uh, male, uh, legally and, and, and to all out, outward intents and purposes, until um, the very late 90s. Um, I had not been in practice at the bar very long. I mean, I, I'd been uh, practicing barrister in my own right really for three years or something after pupillage at that stage. Uh, and I then took, took the, the plunge, which was something I think was always written in the stars, and I always knew I was going to do it really at the appropriate time. Um, and I transitioned to being and presenting as, as female, uh, changed my name, changed everything else, and then just carried on with my practice, in one or two instances, in, even in mid-case, 
um, uh, came back as somebody else. My clients were all wonderful. Uh, my colleagues were all wonderful, and I, I just got on with it. I, would ne I never encountered any difficulty with any judge, never encountered any difficulty with any client or any colleague, uh, and I just had the most wonderful experience. Uh, and my career just carried on, and indeed took off after that, because when you've been living with a, uh, something else that you have to deal with in life, it takes away perhaps half your mental capacity, and suddenly you find yourself freed up to do other things with, what, with the other half of your brain. Uh, and uh, I wrote more books and worked better, enjoyed life more, and just did generally better in, in my career. Um, and I, I think I've th thrived since then. Um, and uh, I don't think I would have ever have ended up being a judge if I'd still had to carry on coping with something approximating a secret and, and, and uh, some sense of, of not presenting as who I authentically am. The bar being a self-employed profession predominantly was the ideal place for someone from the GLBT community because I, I didn't have an employer. I, did, I didn't have to encounter what at the time was a, a lot of discrimination within employment because it, it's my job, it's my profession, I'm my own boss. And the other professionals, the other barristers around me were absolutely 100% accepting as, as, as they are with other people from different walks of life. Um, and being independent of one another, I think, actually encouraged that ethos of being judged on your own merit. I know when I was five, I might have, uh, might have said to my mother, you know, uh, if I can't be the queen, I'll be a judge. But I hadn't actually, as, a, as an adult, really thought that I could ever be a judge. I was just very grateful to still be in practice as a barrister because when I transitioned from male to female, I did genuinely think that the next day I wouldn't have a career. I had prepared for not coming back. I had prepared for uh, a, a lack of acceptance. And I knew very well that I might be walking away from what could have been a career and I might have to do something else entirely. And of course that, that didn't actually happen. So a highlight in that sense is actually finding that I was welcomed with open, ar open arms rather than being rejected in, in 1999 when I transitioned. Because I have a long-standing interest in court procedure, it was the ideal job for me because traditionally the QB masters write for uh, procedural publications and tend to develop the law in the fields of civil procedure. So it had, al it had always interested me as a, as a possible judicial appointment. A Queen's Bench Master is a type of judge of the High Court, but what we combine with that is that we also case manage cases from the start. In other words, parties issue a case, there are preparatory steps to get it to court, there are decisions to be made about expert evidence, uh, how much evidence, what type of trial, where, in front of what type of judge, and so on. So we, we differ from the conventional High Court judge in that rather than travelling around the country and trying cases exclusively, we do a mix of trial and management and we stay put at the Royal Courts of Justice. So I, I have my, my stability, I have my, my room and I know where I'm going to work every day and I can work out of the, the RCJ in London as well as having a, a wonderful choice of what, what cases I try. I get to choose the cases I try. I'm quite happy with the work-life balance as, as a judge. Um, I, I think perhaps because I enjoy it so much, I don't find the work burdensome. I enjoy writing judgments. I don't find it a chore. Not every judge enjoys writing them, but I, I love writing judgments. So if I have a case where there's an interesting point of law, it's actually a pleasure for me to spend my time doing that. Uh, and I'm very lucky. My partner is a psychiatrist in the NHS, and she's, quite ac she's an academic herself, effectively. She's been a lecturer in the subject as well. Uh, and has her own academic interests in that field. So often we'll be at home and both doing our own academic projects, if you like, at home as, as well. Um, so it's part, it's part of my life rather than being, if you like, a necess necess necessarily where I would have to separate my work from, from my home life. It's a, it's a pleasure to do both and perhaps to talk to my partner about that and bounce ideas off her as she does with me because I come from a psychology background as well. And psychiatry involves a lot of law when you're talking about capacity issues, sectioning patients, 
being, if you like, judge and jury, if you're the, if you're the consultant psychiatrist sectioning someone and, and the human rights that comes into that. So we spark off each other a lot at, at home. Um, and it, I mean, it's a lovely job in terms of, of uh, you know, good holidays, um, good working. I mean, people complain about the working conditions uh, in courts, but it's difficult to complain about working in the Royal Courts of Justice. It's a suspended place. It may, may have rats and peeling paint, but it's, it's otherwise actually very nice, and I'd much rather be there than in a, in a tower block somewhere.